so my name is Brianna Reinhold. Um, I am a licensed professional counselor. I'm also the owner of Northern Lights Therapy. Um, we have our main office out here in Maricopa, Arizona, and then a second office out in Chandler. Um, I'm a, the clinical director of the board approved supervisor, so I oversee our associate clinicians um, and some interns. I'm also a certified first responder counselor and an emergency responder and public safety certified clinician. And then I've been approved by the Fraternal Order of Police as an approved wellness provider. Um, I've also done some guest speaking engagements on different topics, and then um, I'm contracted with some local police departments for um, CISM and debriefs and, you know, services from a clinical standpoint. So I wanted to come in today, and I was really grateful that Dr. Dara um, is kind of me giving me this opportunity. Um, so much I think we hear about spouses or the first responders themselves. How can we support them? How can we be there for them? Um, and not much is talked about the kids that grow up in these lives. Um, I was brought up in it, I worked in it, and now I specialize in that from a clinical standpoint. And so I wanted to just give a little bit of insight to what, if any of you have kids or you have coworkers um, that have them, maybe some of the stuff that they experience um, from that perspective of a hands-on and then maybe what you can do to help them. Um, I work with the first responders as a clinician, I work with the spouses and I've gotten a lot of kids to over the years to try and help bridge that gap. So feel free to throw in questions. If I get, can't get to it now, I'll have my contact information at the end as well um, or the chat box I can go through and respond to. Um, I'm an open book, so I really won't hide anything. Um, I know I have family on and my family is going to be talked about here. So most of what will be said, they've heard. Um, I don't know if I have anybody from Glendale PD where I work. So, you know, jump in guys, if you have stuff to say as well, um, but feel free, anything open book completely here, um, transparent. It's the awareness. I think we need to have more transparent and open conversations. So without further ado, um, going to kind of just go through my family experience. So you guys have a good understanding of where I kind of come from. Um, this is my dad. His name's Kirk Snell. He is retired at this point. Um, he worked at Glendale Police Department for pretty much my entire life. So I was born in 86. He started there in 82 and retired in 2013. Throughout his time there, he worked patrol. He was on the warrant detail. He did undercover um, investigations with robbery and homicide, which is what most of my life I remember him was doing the investigation side. Um, he also was in internal investigations. He was a SWAT team negotiator, which growing up the child of that was always tons of fun. Um, he did firearms instructor, and then he was also part of Honor Guard. So when you ask him what his greatest honor was, it was always part of Honor Guard. Um, he really liked having that ability to kind of be there to support and honor the officers, whether with our department or any of the other ones. Um, that was one of the things that really always stood out to me about him. Um, and when he worked in internal affairs, he was not the one that most people feared. He truly wanted to have that fairness um, to work there to try and advocate for the officers instead of just throwing the book at them and try and change that um, common misconception about what that department was within the agency. Um, his favorite position, though, was investigations. Um, he absolutely loved it. I can remember, I mean, growing up in the early 90s, technology definitely wasn't what it is now. So he'd come home with his files and it'd be all spread out and he'd be looking at them and, you know, going through it. And that was what I remember most of my, my childhood. Um, there's the one picture up there. He's got his long hair. Me and my brother, we'd cut it. Um, he'd have times he'd come home and we'd have barrettes in his hair and makeup. And yet he's this big, bad, burly um, undercover guy. So it was kind of a, a different um, lifestyle. One of the things though, that my dad really struggled with was the emotional availability. It wasn't there. Um, he would come home, he would shut down, um, kind of isolate. You didn't hear him talking much, except usually out of anger, um, kind of short tempered at times. It was definitely the culture though, back then. And still, unfortunately today, there was that, you know, men don't cry, especially officers. You signed up for this, suck it up. And so they would go through, including him and just try and deal with it. Never did deal with it, but tried to put on that mask. Um, and so we didn't talk much. I think I remember seeing my dad cry once and it wasn't until I was really a teenager. Um, I was always kind of on edge, didn't know how to react to some things or what I could go to talk to him about. It just wasn't there. I always felt safe with him. I just didn't feel the emotional safety um, because I didn't know if he had that capability, the judgment. I just never knew. So I learned how to kind of cover up my own emotions for a while. Um, I learned how to mask it and how to just kind of do what I needed to do to skate by. Um, 
And then also I was the oldest of two. I was also a firstborn daughter. So you tie in some of those components to the life that he saw day in and day out with his job. Um, I was very much trying to be sheltered and it wasn't in a naive sense. It was, he knew what the real world was like. So I had very strict um, curfews. I had very strict rules I had to follow. My brother was younger, almost five years younger and he had a little bit more freedom, boy versus girl. Um, but my dad wanted me to succeed. He wanted me to stay safe. Um, I remember he would come home with polygraph testers and there was a new one that had come out and he brought it home and it was for an eye scan. And so they would actually go through and you could tell by the lies through the eyes, the uh, pupil dilation. And he came home and I was about 15 or 16. So, you know, right at the peak of teenage years and rebellious times. And he goes, Hey, I want to test this out on you. And my heart sunk because no daughter wants to be polygraphed, especially by their dad, who's literally a trained professional on this. Um, and he went through with it. And luckily when we started going, I think the second question he went to ask me, the thing stopped working. And I finally felt like this wave of relief of like, okay, whew, never did he bring it home again. So I knew I was safe and I didn't have to, you know, have all of my secrets come out. Cause at that point, what do you do? He's got literally a device. He's going to tell him I'm lying. So you either lie or be honest and he's going to know either which way. So that was kind of just what life was like. Um, you got used to it, you dealt with it, and you kind of just moved on and went to the next thing. Um, one of the worst things, though, was my parents split when I was 10, and so he always kind of just stayed single. I kind of helped take care of my brother, but there was numerous nights that he would get called out for SWAT, um, homicides, whatever, and it was, he'd come wake me up 2, 3 in the morning. Hey, I've got to call out. I've got to go, and there's no going back to sleep, 14, 15. I didn't know if he'd come home. I didn't know if he would make it. Um, still gets me emotional to this day. Um, so you had to kind of carry that and then check in on my younger brother, make sure he got up for school. I still had to go to school and social media wasn't is what it is now. And I'm probably grateful for that because I didn't have the exposure of what social media pushes out there now, which is constant. Um, you know, you hear instantly about things that happen. I didn't have that. So I knew if something happened, I would have actually been notified versus reading it on Facebook or TikTok or whatever the case may be. So I can't even imagine teenagers today that have that on top of everything else as I had then. But that was a constant fear that the work that he did, I didn't know if he would come home. So from a kid's perspective, I mean, it sucks. And then you kind of go into my mom. So I know she's on here. So hi, mom. Um, Debbie Willis. So she had a couple different kind of career choices within law enforcement. So she was a reserve officer with Arizona DPS for a year. And she went patrol with Peoria Police Department for a year. And then she was with Glendale Police Department for most of her career. That's where my parents had met. Um, most of my life that she worked there, she was dispatch or callback supervisor. Um, my mom and my dad are absolute opposites. The divorce was probably one of the best things for the two of them. I hold no ill feelings. I think they're both amazing people. They just weren't the best together. My mom is and was the complete opposite of my dad. She was kind of like all sunshine and rainbows, absolute positive outlook on life. Um, I definitely could get one over on her growing up as a teenager. So I felt a little bit more freedom with her versus my dad with the polygraph test. So you had kind of two worlds and divorced parents. So you're kind of getting raised in this. Who can you get away with? How can you skirt things? Um, typical teenager stuff, but the added of the first responder things. Um, I remember they used to have, and I wish they'd bring it back, but take your daughter to work days. And I lucked out. Most of my family worked for the Glendale Police Department. So I would kind of bounce around from the different departments. So I'd go spend some time in investigations. Um, my uncle worked there. My future stepdad worked there. Didn't know him at the time, but my mom was there. So I'd go to dispatch. I'd go to investigations. I would go, you know, patrol, whatever. And I was fortunate enough that I got to sit there and listen to a lot of the 911 calls. Probably not the most beneficial for an eight, nine, 10 year old to do but I got to really hear what my mom had to listen to. And I understood dispatch from a very different perspective versus just what officers go through. And I think a lot of people focus on officers, they're seeing things on a regular basis, but dispatch, they hear it. They don't get any of the other sensories. They don't get to see it. And oftentimes they don't get a follow-up. So they just have this call end and they're just left wondering what happens. And so that's its own level of trauma. And they literally have to jump right onto the next call and start talking about whatever that next trauma is, and literally push aside, compartmentalize whatever they just had to deal with onto the next one. 
And so there's a lot that gets carried. And I think dispatch for a long time, and even again, still now, kind of gets forgotten about as part of this culture that absolutely needs to have people speak up for them and recognize that they go through the trauma just as much as our officers do, if not sometimes more. Um, once she retired from Glendale, she ended up over at ADOT and she ended up retiring um, almost a year ago now from that. So she's fully retired. Um, and so, yeah, there's, there's both of those sides. So I had complete opposites growing up and kind of just different worlds, which ended up leading to all of the rest of my family. So I've got two different slides, kind of just a run through. I've got my cousin who was um, Phoenix um, after she was Air Force. She ended up medically retiring. She did mainly patrol. She also did some undercover work, some gang, tour, gang task force, all of that. Um, my uncle was a fire captain before he retired. I have my stepsister and her husband who both are Scottsdale senior police analysts. She was also a dispatcher for a while. Um, good old early eighties picture of the black and white down there at the bottom. That was my uncle when he first kind of had started. You've got the top right, which is the original SWAT team from Glendale Police Department. My stepdad was part of that. Um, so it's just, it literally was my world. I didn't know anything other than law enforcement and military. Um, I had to throw that top left. That's my uncle. If you can't figure out eighties, I mean, that right there is like the epitome of the mullet, the gun, the pose. I just, it's hilarious. Um, but he was a Sergeant. He was also on SWAT. So was my stepdad. They were explosives, firearms instructors. Um, you've got my stepbrother down at the bottom that is a fire captain and a paramedic. He also does wildland firefighting. Um, and then my cousin's husband from Phoenix, uh, Mike, who was canine and is now retired. Um, so it's been in our blood. And other than my brother, who went complete opposite, he went a musical route. Um, it's all been law enforcement or veterans of some sort that have kind of been in this family. So I felt like that was always kind of my calling, but it never really felt right. Um, but in 2006, I ended up starting at Glendale Police Department. I was a baby, I was 19 years old. Um, I started in the jail. I didn't wanna work fast food. I didn't really wanna do your typical right out of high school job. And somehow I landed in the jail. Um, I was bright eyed and bushy tailed. I probably should not have been there. It helped me grow up. I learned a lot. Um, I made a lot of good connections but I saw even more what first responders go through. Um, our officers are overworked. I tried to help implement stuff within the jail to help get them back out on the streets. Um, I was part of their critical incident stress management team. I was a team leader for their peer support team and I was involved in our two line of duty deaths with Glendale Police Department, um, Officer Anthony Holly and then Brad Jones. And that was its own world. Um, Holly was one of my best friends and a neighbor and so, the impact from both of those still to this day are hard. Um, we didn't know at Glendale how to deal with it. Holly was really the first one. So there was a lot of progress that happened by the time Jones had happened, but it was just one of those things that kind of fly by the seat of your pant, figure out what to do, be there for one another, but also it was still pushing on the back of your burner. Um, you got a job to go do, we have to still do this. And it was mixed emotions on how I kind of felt. I tried to want to push through, but governmental red tape, right? It's hard to push through on these things and try to get people to wanna to make changes. I guess it's fast. I'm not very patient. I want things to happen when they need to happen. And it just wasn't. Um, so I was also working on my master's, which was a great opportunity working in the jail. I worked graveyard weekends, which allowed me the chance to go to school for my master's. And so in 2012, I ended up graduating with my master's in mental health counseling with the forensic concentration. I wanted to work more with law enforcement, um, victims, all of that world that just oftentimes is not really focused on. Um, I never wanted to be the counselor that worked with people who couldn't deal with their carpool schedule or were anxious, you know, with to me what I consider kind of minimal stuff. I wanted to really help those that didn't feel like they had somebody to connect with. Um, one of the biggest pushes of me even going into counseling or mental health field was starting as early as eight, my dad would bring home VHS tapes um, and he would watch them of the interviews he did with homicide suspects. And I would sit there and watch. I wasn't grossed out. Obviously they were graphic in the descriptions, but my curiosity always was just why. 
why did somebody do this? You know, why did somebody kill their mom? Why did somebody go out and do these horrific things? Because to me, I got that side from my mom of just people are good. Why not just be nice and help and kind of be there to lift each other up? So that combined with watching what my dad went through, my family went through, officers I worked with, and the pain that they bottled up constantly and didn't really enjoy life, to me wasn't fair. They're doing a service to our community. They're keeping our office or our streets safe, but nobody's looking out for them. And I wanted to become that person. And so I took the master's and I ran with it. Somehow, though, it detoured through my internship, and I ended up working as a psychology associate at Adobe. It's the Arizona Department of Juvenile Corrections. Um, when I was there, I worked on the violent offender unit and the sex offender unit for juveniles. Um, I actually really enjoyed that. It was a different world. It was something I never thought I could enjoy, and I did it for quite a while. I transitioned out of the prison and then went into community mental health. So I worked there with juvenile and adult sex offenders, a lot of them on probation and parole. And then I transitioned into working with survivors of sexual abuse um, and trying to focus more on the victim sense. But again, our system is skewed, just like with government, community mental health is jacked up. Um, and I, again, got tired of the red tape. I got tired of things not being able to happen the way they needed. And so in 2020, I made the decision to open up my own private practice. Um, it was meant to just be myself. And I now have two locations, a third coming, hopefully in Texas, to um, 15 clinicians, and we keep growing. My entire goal is to actually bring services to the community, awareness. Um, I'm not out to make just a quick buck. To, I actually want people to heal. Um, and that's where I started focusing more back on my original goals, which was the first responders and really branching out and providing those services that are not widely available. Um, it's hard to find clinicians that understand this world. It's hard to find them that get the dark sense of humor. Um, the ones that aren't going to be quick to throw you under the bus or judge you or want to report you, but instead understand that you don't want to talk about your emotions. You just want to fix them. Um, and so I've gotten trained in a ton of modalities that help to actually get to the root of the problem instead of throwing meds at you or making you come in for years and years and years and just talk. We all know first responders are really good at compartmentalizing. You know, they can have their emotions here and they can throw their thoughts over here and absolutely separate the two and tell you they're fine and they've convinced themselves to that extent, but they're not. And that's where the drinking or the drugs or the isolation or the sex or the racing, all of those adrenaline pumping high-risk activities start to increase and it's just not healthy for them and the toll it starts to take on their families. So that's kind of the background where I'm at today, but I know when I go to trainings, I always like to bring in information that I can actually use and apply to kind of the outside world. So this part is more of just what can you do if you have kids, um, if you know of people that have kids in this field, how can you maybe look at it through a different lens to help your own kids um, navigate this very different world. It is not something that is very relatable unless they have other friends that their parents are in this world. Um, and then it's gonna depend on how the parents are, how mentally and emotionally available they are and in tune. Um, so this is just kind of some tips and tricks. And if anybody ever wants these slides too, you can email me at the end and I'm happy to send them over. Um, but as of 2023, there are more than 800,000 sworn officers in the US. So this is just sworn. This is not including dispatch. This is not including fire personnel. This is not including paramedics, none of that. So we're looking at just roughly 800,000 sworn officers alone in the United States. Now, how many children do you think are coming from that? Um, if you just average out and just say all first responders are at 800,000, which obviously is not even close to what it is at one person having one child, that's 800,000 kiddos that are living this life and probably don't really realize how different it is. And the parents don't realize how things are going to impact them differently um, for both the short term and the long term. So some of the impact personally from what I grew up with, some of the research I've done, um, there's four kind of main things that are impactful on the children that have law enforcement parents. Um, I tend to focus a little bit more on law enforcement. That was more of my upbringing. A lot of this can translate into fire, um, dispatch, all of that. It's pretty universal, but for the most part, you'll notice a lot of the law enforcement talk. Um, so there's a need to be perfect. So 
unknowingly, and I think with good intentions, the parents that are the first responders want their kids to be that quote unquote perfect. They're going to feel like they're constantly being watched or judged, right? If my kid screws up and I'm a cop, how is that going to be a reflection on my ability to take care of the general public? I know I've even struggled with that as a therapist. If my kiddos are struggling, it's, ooh, if I can't help my own kid, how can I be expected to help somebody else's kids? And that's our own, I guess, demise that we do to ourselves. And we need to stop that because they're still people too. And we have to recognize that they're going to be their own person and we need to support them and help guide them. But ultimately it's not up to us of who they become in their life. Um, the more we want them to be perfect, the more we're actually probably gonna push them to having issues or perfectionism or high anxiety, or they're gonna flat out rebel and say, screw you, watch me and see what I can do. Um, it can have them test more boundaries. Um, there's that age old kind of philosophy that, right, the preacher's kid. The preacher's kid is the one that's probably gonna be in the most trouble, the one that's out having unprotected sex, drinking, doing drugs. A lot can be said for first responder kids as well. They don't want to have as much of that um, at school. Oh, your dad's a cop, you're a snitch. Or you don't know how to fun, how to have fun because your parents are this type of job. Um, and you want to almost prove yourself as not being part of that. I'll be 100% honest, as much as I supported my parents, I also hated the fact that I was a cop's kid. Um, growing up in the 90s, early 2000s for high school, it was hard. I was teased a lot. I was absolutely told like, oh, you're just going to snitch on anything we do. So I had to have this up and more higher ability for myself to push boundaries that I probably wouldn't have even done if those things weren't said. I'm lucky and grateful that I was able to pull away from it and get on the right path, but not everybody does. And so the peer pressure is there to fit in with your peers and not with your parents. Um, I hated cops for a while and not in a way that I wanted things to happen, but I just didn't want to be associated with it. Um, and so that was something that I had a couple friends that their parents were in the same field growing up and we all were that way. We just didn't like being associated with it. Um, some of the other impacts is higher levels of stress. So like I was saying earlier, my dad would wake me up at two, three in the morning. Hey, I'm going on a call out. I don't know if he's coming home. I don't know if he's going to make it. Um, that's a lot of stress on a kid. There's a constant fear that you're not going to have your parent. And it's not because they got in a car accident. It's because they went and did a job and was protecting somebody else. And I may lose my parents because they're helping take care of somebody else. Um, I look back at 2020. I couldn't imagine if I was growing up and my parents were cops at that time with all of the um, riots and all of the hatred. I have friends that they're law enforcement now and their kids are were terrified for their parents to go to work, especially with all of the political climate back in 2020. That's a lot of stress on a kid on top of just trying to figure out who they are, navigate life, go through hormonal stages. Um, grades can start to suffer. They can have issues with peers. They can have higher um, tendency to get into fights to act out, not because they're trying to rebel, but because they don't know how to handle that stress. Nobody's talking to them or it's just talking down to them about how horrible that their dad is because they're a cop and they're out to just shoot people. Um, I can't imagine having that be said to me growing up even now and yet our kids are hearing that that are growing up in this world, um, especially when their uh, parents are law enforcement for the most part. Fire they tend to be, there's fire on here. I love fire too but they're a little bit more of the heroes. And so less of that is happening with the cops. So it's just cops are out to kill. And that's what's being said to them. You have more exposure to the dark side too. Um, it was one thing I'm grateful for. I think I was less naive and became more aware at an early age, but there's also, it's not a good thing. You don't want to have kids grow up too fast. Um, I absolutely grew up pretty fast. I had a lot of exposure to things. I was talked to about a lot of things that I didn't really understand. Um, I knew that what was shown in movies was not real. And in all honesty, I wish it was more of what I saw in movies than what I had to see in real life. Um, I think movies, I could definitely see the Hollywood side to it, but knowing that my parents or family are going out and taking that risk, it's hard. And so you have to help navigate that and make sure that it's not impacting the kids and shifting their perspective of how much good is really in the world versus bad. Um, we can all become really cynical really fast. I'm sure there's lots of us on here that tend to do that. We tend to see the negative in things. I still do at times or the hypervigilance. Um, I still to this day cannot sit 
with my back facing the door at a restaurant. That is really common. My dad and I will actually fight for that seat. Um, if him and I go out to eat, I trust my dad that he'll obviously protect me if something happens, but I still have that need to do because I just have that innate fear that they're still out there. And I think being a counselor and hearing a lot of trauma and working with sex offenders and working with law enforcement, I've heard a lot on top of growing up in it and raising and working in it. But it's a thing that no kid should have to already have that input into their head as a younger child because it does cause kind of longer term things and impacts. So we kind of get to this. So with all of this, how can you help your kid, right? How can you try and mitigate some of this? And again, there's no rhyme or reason. Every kid's going to be different. Every parent's going to be different. Every situation, even where are you living at can be different. Um, if you're living where law enforcement is seen more as heroes and accepted, amazing. I love it. Um, your kids are probably not going to have as much stress and things thrown at them. If you're living in, you know, out here, South Phoenix, and there's parts that just absolutely despise law enforcement, you're probably going to have more people saying things and feeling that higher levels of stress. So here's just kind of some tips to consider. One is support your child. Be a parent first and a cop second. Um, how many of you will literally jump into cop mode when something happens with your kids? It's kind of just a automatic. We're used to it. We want to do it, but you can't. You are not meant to be a cop to your parents. I cannot be a therapist to my own kid as much as I would love to, and I can help guide. I need to have her in her own therapy. You can't be a cop to your own kid because they don't have a separation. They need support. They need loving. They need somebody that's going to actually sit there and want to hear what they have to say, not rush to fix it. Um, most cops want to fix things. Sit down and ask your kid. Do you need me to fix this or give you suggestions or do you just need me to listen? That will probably make the biggest difference for your child because I know there were several times, especially with my dad, he was more of the fixer. My mom was more of the listener. If I went to my dad with something, he immediately, oh, well, just do this, this, and this. I didn't need that though. I already kind of knew what I needed to do. I just needed to be heard and validated. And so if you don't know what your kid needs or that's something that's hard for you to do, ask them, okay, what do you want to talk about? And do you want me to help you fix this? Or do you want me to just sit here and listen and then take what they say? And as much as it may be hard, swallow that wanting to fix it and just listen. I promise it'll help them to feel more open and honest and overall safe, not just physically, but emotionally. Um, secondly, I know those overtime checks are nice guys. I know we like that extra money. I know that's what you do to pay for the extra boat or the vacation or the Christmas gifts coming up but the job's gonna go away. The material items are gonna go away. You need to put time with your kids first. Make it a point to go to their sports games. Make it a point to go to their musical concerts. Make it a point to just be at home and be present versus always wanting to chase that dollar. It's not gonna matter to them whether they have the newest video game, I promise you. I can't tell you most of what my Christmas gifts were growing up, but I can tell you about the road trips we took or the campaign trips or the things that we went and did. Um, I understand economic times are hard right now. So obviously you want to make sure you can pay your bills and put food on the table, but don't have this higher kind of lifestyle that you want, because what happens when that overtime goes away too, and then you're stuck with all those extra bills, try and prioritize family time before you focus on just wanting to provide material items. Don't set standards that are impossible to meet. Um, kind of going back to the impact slide that I had shared. We know we want your kids to be productive members. We know that you don't want them to get in trouble. I don't think any parent wants to see their kids going down a hard path, but really ask yourself, are your expectations of them actually attainable or is it you putting an unattainable kind of um, level out there and standard for them? Is it because you want them to actually make those standards happen or is it because you're terrified of what may happen if they don't and the reflection that it is on you? Children are their own person. They're gonna grow up into their own personality. You may have some influence on it, but it's still not on you. It is on them, excuse me. And if you give them more control and you give them the chance to be a little rebellious, to challenge things, to explore who they wanna be, you're ultimately setting them up to really be trusting of themselves that they will make those longer term decisions. But if you have really high standards, your child is probably gonna always feel anxious not really trust their own gut. And that can lead to longer term mental health issues as well of anxiety and things like that. So 
If you don't know, take a step back. If you have older kids, teenagers, ask them, have those open conversations. We are not perfect as parents. Tell them that, hey, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm trying to figure this out. Do I have too much expectations on you? Am I asking of things that are just absolutely not worth what you feel you need in life and hear what they have to say and be open and vulnerable. And it's going to help you try and figure out how to actually be there to work with your kids. Perfection is not something that's attainable. And if we expect that our kids are going to just continue to rebel against us. Don't get so wrapped up in saving the world that you forget about those at home. This is something even myself, I still struggle with. Um, Working in law enforcement, first responders, you are going to see more pain and tragedy than pretty much anybody else is going to see. Um, you see it day in and day out. You see it in the community that you live in. So even with military, they can kind of separate it because it's overseas. Here, we're seeing what you see oftentimes in your own backyard, especially if you live where your beat is. Um, that can really struggle for you to take a step back and recognize that most people do not ever experience that and their problems are much less. To kids and teens, think about it. If you have teens, think back to when your kids were little toddlers. If you, my son's notorious for this, he's three. If I open the banana one day, he will scream at me because he wanted to open the banana that day. But I swear the next day I will hand it to him unopened and then he screams at me because he wanted me to open it. There is no right or wrong. I have no idea every day I have to ask him. But to him, not having the banana opened or having it opened is literally the worst part of his entire day. And he will cry and scream. And to me, I'm just like, grow up. Like it's done and over with. I promise you'll forget in two seconds. And he does. My teenager, if I tell her no, she literally can't watch a TV show, right? It's the end of the world. Um, I don't allow her to have a cell phone still. She's 14. To her, that's the end of the world. And I have to hear it constantly. To me, that's not a big deal. And there's a whole lot worse out there. But that's because I've seen a lot more than she probably ever will. And I'm kind of grateful that I've seen it and not her. We have to remember that our kids are growing up and they have their own set of problems that seem life altering to them try to take a step back and remember that that is what we need to focus on, not the really nasty world that's out there. Um, and again, you'll have more of that kind of empathy for your kids. Use the job as a teaching tool. So age appropriate, always. Obviously, don't go try and talk to your five-year-old about you know some massive sex talks, being raped, those types of things. But if you start out when they're younger, having those open conversations can just help as they get older. It opens the door, first of all, for trust and communication as they get older, um, but it can also help them to understand better what your job is. If you don't ever tell them what your job is like from a honest, age-appropriate perspective, all they have to go off of is what they see in TV, movies, on the news, on social media, and from their friends, which I guarantee you is going to incite more fear into them or more hurt because they're gonna think you're a bad person but depending on what their friends are saying. And if you talk to them about it, it helps lessen some of that anxiety. They get to understand a little bit better about what it is that you do, how you are trying to help, how you are trying to be there for them. Maybe why you come home and you're a little bit more sad or you're angry or you have a little bit um, stricter rules on. I didn't understand a lot of the rules growing up. Now I absolutely do. I don't allow sleepovers. Um, my kids aren't allowed to go sleep over anywhere except two houses. I just, you never know, even if it's friends or family. I know too many of those times that those are the people that actually cause more harm to the kids. My daughter doesn't understand that. She will when she's older, but it's just where things are at and we talk about why. And so having those open conversations, our kids aren't stupid. They don't need to be left in the dark. They need to understand the world they're coming into and learning from you to help them stay safe. Um, talking about rape as they get older, talking about drugs, just because you talk about these things doesn't mean your kid's going to go do it. Um, if you talk about porn on social media, it doesn't mean your kid is going to go look at porn. It's They're already aware of it. Just FYI, average age is eight on social media now that kids are accessing porn. Um, so with that, we need to have these conversations. Otherwise we're putting our kids in a huge stance to become a victim in so many different ways or start addictions really early on simply because we think 
that we're doing them a favor by staying quiet. We're not. We need to be talking and teaching them and what better than what you guys are seeing on a daily basis out in the world. This one is what drove me to doing this kind of um, field. Be emotionally healthy and available. Stop trying to hide your emotions. While it's improved over the years, there still is a lot of departments. There still is a lot of um, old school mindset, especially in the higher ranking positions of suck it up. We don't need to talk about it. You're weak if you show those emotions. We have to keep working on that departmental change. Um, if you continue with that mindset, you're inadvertently teaching your children to also bury their emotions. And I can almost guarantee any of you on here that struggle with sharing your own emotions, I can guarantee you don't want your kids to go through that same thing. You want them to be able to talk, to share, to open up. And if they're watching you bottle it up, they're watching you drink it away, they're watching you work constantly to avoid dealing with it, what do you think they're going to do? They're su sucking up everything that we're doing, whether you think they are or not. They're sponges, even through high school. So by you going to counseling, by you opening up, by you crying in front of your kids, you're actually teaching them how to take better care of themselves. You're teaching them what they're deserving of from partners, from friendships, from the world. You're teaching them how to advocate for themselves. Be the role model that you wanted when you were growing up. Be the parent that actually cares about your kids. Break generational trauma by showing them that it's okay to not be okay. Um, practice coping skills, be vulnerable. All of those types of things can have a massive impact on your kid and on you in the long run by working through those things. You don't always have to win. I think a lot of you will be out on the street, right? And losing is not an option. It may be life or death. Um, obviously, we want to get the bad guy. We want to keep the streets safe. We want to put them away. Your kids are not the bad guy. Your kids aren't needing somebody to compete with. You have to sit there and come home and recognize that it's a different place. Um, take off your armor, you know, before you walk in the front door and remember that you're at home and that these people are there. They love you. They're there to care. If something happens with your kids, whether they get in trouble or something happens to them, talk with them about it. Don't try and react. Don't immediately go to consequences. Dara was kind of talking about that. Don't walk up and go, why were you late? How are you doing? That little shift can massively change how somebody responds to you because they're not gut intuitively going, oh, I'm in trouble. It's, oh, okay. And there's usually a reason behind it. Most kids are not trying to just be assholes. They just don't want to get in trouble. None of us did as kids. But if you come at that perspective, they're going to shut down and they're not going to know what to say. And they're going to get kind of defensive then your cop mentality will tend to kick up and then it's gonna be a power struggle and neither of you are gonna win. All it's gonna do is push you further apart and break that communication, break that level of trust and understanding. Talk to them, what's going on? Why did you make that choice? Was the outcome what you had hoped it to be? What can you learn from this so maybe it doesn't happen in the future? Be compassionate, don't be authoritative. You're not the judge and jury for them, you're a parent and you're guiding them. Kind of in line with that is that don't overreact. Your kids are going to get in trouble at some point. Hold them accountable. Make sure that the consequences are appropriate to whatever they did. Um, but be loving, be supportive, help guide them to make better choices. If it's serious enough trouble though, and say they do something and they drastically break the law, don't bail them out either. Um, they may need to learn. You can't be their savior. We have to have consequences still. And that's how kids are going to learn. You need to be that compassionate parent, but also, yeah, you really messed up on this one and you're going to have to follow through on the consequences. It's going to be hard. And a lot of teenagers, especially are going to push against it and say how you don't love them or come on, I promise I won't do it again. You have to hold that boundary of no, you made that choice. Here's the consequence, but I still love you and I'll be here to help you through it. And that is what's going to help them kind of succeed and ideally pull themselves out of whatever's going on. Um, and then always kind of think back. I can guarantee every single person on here made some pretty questionable choices growing up. Maybe you didn't get caught. Maybe you did. Maybe you lucked out and nobody knows about it. I know most of my teenage years, thankfully, the cell phones are not what they are. It's not on social media. Give your child some grace. 
make sure that you're actually giving them that opportunity to learn from it um, without fear of how you're going to blow up and react on them. So kind of just in summary, support your child, be that parent first, be a cop second. Don't get wrapped up in saving the world that you forget about those at home. Don't set your standards too high that they're impossible to meet. Use the job as a teaching tool. Be emotionally healthy and available. You don't always have to win and don't overreact. Remember that parenting is difficult. Being in law enforcement is also difficult. When you combine those things, it adds its own unique set of challenges. However, you are capable of succeeding in both. Just focus on what is important and prioritize your family first. Your job is just a job. Your family is what you should be focusing on. Um, here is my contact information. Uh, that's my direct work cell. You can text it, you can call it, my direct email, our website. There's also resources on our website. I'm in process of updating it. Um, I've got local resources. I've got national for law enforcement as well. Um, I'm still old school. I like Facebook. I have an Instagram for the business. I hardly post on it. I don't do TikTok. So if you're on Facebook like we are, follow us. I post stuff regularly, law enforcement, just mental health, um, positive affirmations, things like that. Um, I truly want awareness out there. I truly want to help support and guide and whatever people need, we can do it. Um, if you're in Arizona, we can help connect you with a clinician out here. If one of us or myself is not available, we can do virtual or out of either of our offices. Um, kind of just a quick, finding a culturally competent therapist is hard. Um, there's quite a few that are good. We've got a really good connection and network out there. And so Dara can connect you with them. I can. I know Lauren's on here with EM. East Valley Trauma, she's one of them. If none of us can take you or we don't have the right set, we will put you in contact because we want you guys to get help, not being scared that somebody is not going to know what they're doing and be ready to just kind of lock you up and throw away the key. So reach out. I'm here if anybody needs anything. Well said, Brianna. This is uh, so helpful. I mean, hearing from your perspective, and actually, even when you and I met and we had lunch, I didn't realize the depth of relationships in the first responder world. We yeah. talked about it, but I mean, to see it in picture form, it feels different, you know? Oh, and that's not even all of the pictures. That was just <laughs> what I could gather, because most of them have retired, so I don't have a CD drive to pull the pictures up anymore, but yeah. it's it's literally my entire bloodline, yeah. Wow. I had a I had a cop who retired um and he's he he was an acquaintance of mine and uh he said that his for his children specifically he would try to empower them through the power of positive is what he called it. And he said, you know, if if his child called him for help instead of trying to problem solve for the child, because the child was older at this point, he would say, Hey, I know you've been through difficult times in the past. How did you solve that before? And so he would put it back on a child. And, I, and it really, when he said that statement, it, it just like how you just smiled, you know, I was like, oh my gosh, what an amazing thing yep. to tell a child to help them problem solve, you know? Absolutely. We, we do take that away, right? We take the power and control away from kids and from our spouses and everybody else that we interact with sometimes when we are like, okay. I'm impatient. I have ADD. I don't want to sit here and watch you try to figure this stuff out. Let me fix it for you real fast and let's move on. Yep. You know? Yep. Um, yeah, we have to take that second to kind of break and let them mess up because I know you can tell me day in and day out, oh yeah, that's not how you do it. And this is going to be the outcome. Okay. I'm not, I still am like, that's not going to happen to me. But then if I do it and I mess up, I'm going to remember that the next time be like, oh, yeah, don't do that because I've already had the consequences happen. And we right. want to step in and save our kids. And we can't even no matter who the kids are, we have to let them fail and then be there to pick them up and let them know we at least will support them as they find their path again. Yeah. All right. Well, this is excellent. I'll chat with more, more of you just now here, but you have a couple of questions that I want okay. to make sure a chance to address. When working with children in therapy, who are children, sorry, children of, of, in therapy, who are children of LEO parents, how do you engage parents in expanding their own awareness of these areas of concern that you identified? So in all honesty, it's kind of going to depend on the age of the kids. So my philosophy is if they're under 12, I really will work with the parents as well, because oftentimes it's not just the kid that's having the issues. It's a parental, it's a family unit. So a lot of family sessions, trying to help them understand what their kids are going through, 
and helping the kids feel like they can talk. I'll do a lot of sand tray and play therapy too, because kids don't have the verbal ability to express what they're feeling, but they can through the use of play and miniatures and kind of um, figurines. And so I'll do it that way. Over 12, I really give them, this is their space. They are my client. I do not go to the parents with anything unless the kid, the teenager is okay with it. And I will try and help them learn how to advocate to talk to their parents. But I can do separate sessions just to help the parents kind of maybe learn how to navigate it without giving specific details of whatever their team's working on. So it depends on the age. It depends on the problems. I think there's not just one person that should be in therapy. Kids are not just the problem. Parents are not just the problem. It's usually a family unit. And so the more you can get the whole family involved, you're going to see more success all around, no matter what. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well said. You know, when we, when I used to work in community mental health in Michigan many, many, many decades ago, um, I remember parents bringing their kids to the clinic and they would drop them off. And these were just civilians and they would say, fix them. I'll be back yep. in an hour. Yep. I'd be like, I don't, I, what, what, can, what can you do, man? I mean, obviously they don't see themselves as being part of the issue, you know? Well, but we've I, kicked we kick kids out of therapy because the kids are not the problem and it's the parents. And if the parents aren't willing to come in and participate, we go, well, your kid's fine. This is a family mm -hmm. issue. And until you're willing to come in and look at it from that perspective, I'm not going to take your money because your kid doesn't need it. Um, mm -hmm. Or sometimes the kid will want to come in because it just gives them a space to vent about their parents mm -hmm. and they know that it's not going to go anywhere. But yeah, the families need to be working on a lot together usually. You know, this comment that came in here is more of a comment on a question, but I am curious if you felt this way too. So my this person said, my son loved to say, why couldn't you just be a nurse or a teacher growing up, like when they were growing up, you know, because they wanted you to have another job rather than being a police officer. Mm -hmm. uh, do you remember feeling that way or saying that stuff to your parents? I don't know if I said it, but I absolutely did feel it. It was almost like I wanted them to be quote unquote normal. Mm -hmm. um, because it wasn't a normal life to live, you know, holidays are never holidays. Even to this day, we have so many still in the fields. We don't celebrate Christmas on Christmas. Most of the time we don't get Thanksgiving on Thanksgiving. It's, oh, the Saturday, three weeks before, because that's when the people are off shift. Um, and so I never understood that growing up. Well, why can't we like it's Christmas, we should be there all together. And that's how it is. So I absolutely had moments that I was just like, I wanted a normal childhood. Now that I'm an adult reflecting back, I absolutely wouldn't change any of it. I think everything happens for a reason. I loved the experiences I had. It's brought me to where I'm at today. It gave me a different perspective on the world. Um, and I'm grateful for it. But growing up, absolutely. Every kid wants to be quote unquote normal. And mm -hmm. if you're singled out or if you don't have that perception to others, it's hard enough being a teenager. Adding those different things in just isn't fun for anybody. So true. You know, for our child, who's 11, she oftentimes says, hey, can you leave me home alone? I want to stay home alone and try it out. And we're like, no, you make decisions like a child. We're not mm -hmm. going to trust you to stay home alone at 11 years old. Yep. But flip that across now that I know that I work with cops who have a five and a nine year old and they're a single parent because this is their second divorce and they have no choice but to go into work and leave the nine-year-old in charge because there's nobody else to help take care of the of the kids that's that a was lot. my childhood i was a latchkey kid mm -hmm. so fast mm -hmm. you know and i think it was good because it gave me more responsibility but at the same time it was bad because it gave me more responsibility at that age my daughter didn't start staying home until she was 14 and even then i won't do overnights it's not long periods of time um like I said, the cell phone, she hates me because I won't let her have one. There's too much out there. And this day and age, it's even more scary, I think, than it used to be. Yet you can have cameras around to check on your house. And so I think not to shame anybody. If you have to, you have to. And you prepare your kids for it. But also maybe try and see how that can cause some impacts later on of putting that much responsibility on them if you can absolutely look at any other options. 